All right, ready? Yes. Yeah. All right, the board is back in open session. Um, at this time, uh, we will hear a welcome by Blythe Park School Principal, Kazmir Gorman. <laughs> Um, busy exciting time of the year it's nice to see all of you um, so just a couple things that have been happening around here as you know because all of you experienced as well as we had our open house last week um, and Blythe Park we typically combine a lot of our events um, it just seems to work for our community so um, we also held our science fair uh, we had students that were showing us how they measured sound waves and then we had other students that were measuring the amount of water in, in various types of foods and using a dehydrator. So it was really cool to see all the thoughts and um, innovation and ideas that the students put together. Um, at that same time, in our auditorium, we had 70 of our early learners and they put on a spring singing performance. So Ms. Jane Lawrence and our music teacher put in some extra time and she worked with the classroom teachers and so they performed about six songs and it was super cute and we only had three criers so <laughs> so um, and we had one very cute kid who popped out underneath the, um, <laughs> the drape right before and it was it was really sweet um, and then we also I don't know if you know about Blythe but we do this annual um, fifth grade tug of war and so at the end of our open house all the fifth graders gather out with their families and everyone else you know from the open house and they do a tug of war competition so we did a bunch of different types of teams and then we get the parents involved at the end so it, it's pretty fun um i did that one year and got myself pretty muddy so, <laughs> so it was a really it was actually a, a very um warm and sunny day so it was beautiful um, our garden club is also starting and so the students have been out doing some weeding and then because they're new members they have are researching all the prairie plants um, because they are going to continue to tend and garden the plants throughout the summer they set up a watering schedule and they have keys to you know unlock the water with their parents and they'll be able to come and do that throughout the summer um, and there's also a bench right behind there that they're going to be doing some some artwork and painting and then on May 17th, we are holding our um, annual ACES walk, and ACES stands for All Children Exercising Simultaneously, and we're combining it this year with our Cardio Kids Run. And so we're doing a, um, a course around Kent. Um, the police and the firemen will be assisting us and running with us. Um, all the, the day before, everyone chalks the whole area and chalks all the sidewalks. And then we will do the, the run and the walk and then gather back here. And we also have a very special um, art unveiling. Earlier this year, uh, the students in all grades, early learners through fifth grade, worked with the Riverside Art Center. And they did um, just a variety of different um, clay figures, but it was like a spring scene. So like little caterpillars and ladybugs and very child-friendly um, little you know artistic figures um, but it has a you know a very special purpose and there's going to be an unveiling of that on May 17th so if you would like to come by the morning of that um, day you are more than welcome but thanks again for being here and um, that's it thanks, thanks Ms. Thank it's uh, great to hear all these uh, exciting things going on here at Blythe a lot of stuff happening um, next item is um, are there any changes to the agenda that any board member would like to propose did you uh, skip public comment? Sorry, skip public comment. Is there any public comment? There's no public comment. Skip then. it for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any changes to the agenda? Uh, if not, we move on to the uh, committee meetings. First committee meeting is education. Uh, Sherry. We hear from Pam Shaw, director of special education, about funding for programs and services. Good evening. I'm here tonight to speak about special education and funding programs and services. And with me, joining me to present tonight are um, Ellie Ambuel, who is the Assistant Executive Director of LADSI, soon to be Executive Director of LADSI, and Brian Riggler, who is the Director of Business Services at LADSI. Okay, so special education is part of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Sometimes you hear it referred to as IDEA. And with um, IDEA, school districts are required to provide free and appropriate education for children in the least restrictive environment. Um, typically, least restrictive environment means their home school. Appropriate supports and services are always determined by the IEP team. And the IEP team is um, the parent or the family and then the school team. 
and we are to provide as a school district a continuum of services and supports for student ages 3 to 22 for our district 3 through 8th grade in District 96. So starting with our youngest learners, we have our Early Childhood Special Education Program, and this program serves um, children ages three to five. And some of the different areas of services that we can provide are speech itinerant services. That's where parents may bring their children um, to uh, one of our elementary buildings to receive speech services once or twice a week. And all the, the amount of time is determined through the evaluation process and dependent on a child's needs. And then we have students who are blended in our early learners program. Um, that is our general education um, setting that we are required to have, mandated to have for young children as well as our kindergarten through eighth grade students. And so there are students with individualized education plans or IEPs with special needs who are blended in with general education students from the community who pay a tuition to attend our program. And then we also have the Early Childhood Special Education um, Classroom, which is a smaller classroom of only up to 10 children. The other classrooms range between 15 to 17 children, but the needs of the other children, they require a smaller structured setting for their services. And then we have some children um, within the district who also attend. LADSI has a communication development classroom from early childhood, which tends to support children more on the autism spectrum. And then we have the LADSI phonological program, which is just a couple days a week. It's a very intense um, phonological speech program for <coughs> children who have a very specific um, speech um, need in the phonological area. And typically, um, students in that program often are not even in the program for a full year. So they rotate through the program and often then come back and receive itinerant services in the district. So in a kindergarten through eighth grade, um, we have, again, itinerant speech and language services. And we have hearing and vision itinerant services. Those are teacher services that are provided through the um, SASID and case cooperatives, and they have teachers that come to our district and provide specific services for students with hearing and vision impairments. And then we have our special education teacher support. We have services where the teachers um, push into the general education classroom. They deliver services to students in the classroom. Sometimes they pull students out and provide um, small group um, instruction or sometimes one-to-one -one, but often small group and then um, at Hauser we also have some of the co-taught and supported classrooms at Hauser Junior High. Then we also have um, public day programs that some of our students attend which are the LADSI programs and the DuPage West Cook programs um, for vision and hearing impairment and then we have private day programs. What we really try to um, have as our children in that itinerant through special education, those first three bullets up, there, those are the programs where we like to have our children in our district as much as possible. They are all programs within the district. And then to support um, students in their educational setting, we also have related services. We have speech and language services um, that are provided by our District 96 speech and language pathologists. For fine motor, we contract with LADSI for occupational therapist. Gross motor, we contract with LADSI also for our physical therapist. And then we have students with emotional needs. We have some District 96 social workers and some social workers provided by LADSI. And the same is true um, with those emotional needs. Our psychologists also support those. We have some that are District 96 employees and some uh, and one employee through LADSI for psychologists. And then we have the assistive technology services that LADSI provides. Um, when we look at assistive technology for a communication device or um, often something more to do with handwriting or for a child with a physical impairment, um, other types of technology that they may need, they um, go through a whole evaluation process to help determine what tool will be the best for that student to use. And then we also have transportation that um, is provided by LADSI through um, Grand Prairie Transit. And then some students also have um, more specific um, 
paraprofessional support in their IEPs. So all these related services help to support the child in their educational program. And the services are not just assigned. The services are determined through an evaluation process. And that evaluation process determines if there is a need in that area. And then minutes are determined um, by the need in order for them to, read ser to receive services. The only area um, that is uh, provided for general education students as well would be social work. They serve general education students as well as um, students with IEPs and psychologists also can help support that as well too. So we do have the public day programs and that's one of the programs I was talking about that is not housed, that is not part of the district programs which, which are through LADSI um, and DuPage West Cook and SASED. The um, LADSI classrooms are housed in the member districts of the LADSI cooperative. For example, our classroom at Hollywood is a LADSI cooperative classroom. There are students from our district who attend there and students from other districts as well. And so some of the different LADSI classroom um, opportunities that we would have for students if they required that level of need, um, we have the communication development class. Um, again, support students um, with autism. We have multi-needs for students with significant um, intellectual disabilities. And then we have the emotional disabilities classroom that LADSI provides um, services for. And then DuPage West Cook um, has um, classes as well in SASID member districts. And they are for the deaf and hard of hearing impairment and self-contained programs for vision impairment and self-contained programming that's as well there. So this would be for students who um, need more than the vision and hearing itinerant can provide within our district if they need a different type of teaching. Some students need how to learn to read Braille and that setting works best but we always do try to then bring students back to the district. And then um, the other setting that some students attend are private therapeutic day schools. Um, these schools are for students whose needs cannot be met in the general education setting or even within a LADSI program. Their needs require um, more services and more supports than we can provide in a public school setting. And as you know, we mentioned the LADSI and SASID and DuPage West Cook programs, those are all within public buildings as well too. So they need very therapeutic, more specialized programs. And so um, these are typically um, access for students who have those more significant behavioral needs on top of some of their, their disabilities. There's challenging behaviors that require more therapeutic setting. So this is a breakdown of percentage of students um, by area of disability. And I know it may be kind of difficult. I'm sure you can see a little bit easier on your iPads. But um, one of the... Um, Specific learning disability um, tends to be one of the um, higher percentage areas in most districts for students um, for special education. But you'll notice developmental delay is also a very large category. And the reason for that is developmental delay is an area of eligibility that captures um, children ages three through nine years of age up to their 10th birthday. So often when we have a young child and it's difficult to determine exactly you know, they're still young, they're still developing, they're still growing, and it's, it's difficult. We know there are delays, but it's difficult to pinpoint exactly what that delay is. We look at the area of developmental delay, and they would need to have um, a delay in, in um, communication, fine motor, gross motor, some social emotional problem solving areas to look at, at that area. And then the others, I think, um, kind of speak to a uh, for themselves, um, autism is an area that tends to be growing over the years, and I have seen the growth even since I have been in the district here. The others tend to be a little bit lower. And then this is, um, when we look at that least restrictive environment or educational environments, this is how the um, students are um, served in various um, educational environments within District 96. So 
we really want um, to see most of our students be in that blue zone um, where 80% or more of their day is in general education. That is our goal, that if all possible that we push our services into the general education classroom rather than pull them out. We know at times we do need to pull them out in order to pro provide a little bit more intense services, but then we also go back and, and try to support those services in the general education classroom. And um, then we do have about 40 to 70 percent of the day in general education is the next category, less than 40 percent of the day in general education, and then served in separate um, or private educational facilities is that last um, green pie of the area. Um, when we look at um, less than 40 percent of the day in general education, um, that is our more very specific self-contained classrooms and probably includes most of our children that are in our LADSI or SASED programs. And then these are the trends of percentage of students with disabilities in the educational environments. We always want to try to have everybody to the left of that, um, of that chart. Um, we want our higher percentages to be in general education. That is our, our calling to have children in the least restrictive environment and to have them in their home schools um, as much as possible with their general education peers. Okay. Thank you. Um, so Pam did a little overview of the programs um, and I'm shifting gears now into funding and kind of talking specifically about um, um, revenues and expenditures when it comes to special education because it is a bit more complex and different than the rest of the educational world. Um, how I broke this down was to talk about revenues, federal, state, um, and then to talk about expenditures, federal, state. Um, so that's kind of the, the way this is organized. Um, so we'll go ahead and go through it. Um, at the federal level, as Pam mentioned, um, the IDEA grant is um, the IDEA law. Um, is a federal title entitlement um, and that provides a significant amount of money from the federal government to all 50 states uh, for the provision of services to students with special education needs. Um, as Pam mentioned, um, special education is, is an entitlement um, and we are um, students are entitled to a free and appropriate public education. So that money is directed to schools to um, accommodate the need for that free um, provision of services. Um, so IDEA is broken into um, several parts. The primary parts impacting an elementary school district are Part B and Part C. Um, part B being significantly larger than Part C but because it covers K-8 and Part C is the preschool grant. Um, the IDEA grant is um, based on your total district enrollment um, and your low income enrollment in your district. And that's a, a formula that applies to all 50 states and um, is a very complex formula. There's not an easy breakdown. It was an, uh, a base amount was set back in, um, I think, the late 70s. It's been adjusted in the 80s and then the 90s. So there's been some adjustments to it. Um, IDEA was impacted by sequestration a few years ago. So um, there's been a number of different impacts to the IDEA grant. Um, but the, the main take home points of that funding is that um, it is not um, dependent on how many kids you have enrolled in special education. It was important to the federal government, it's important to me and Pam as special education directors that um, we don't want to identify more kids to get more money. Um, we really want to identify kids who need services. So um, the, that is actually part of the law that it is just based on um, district enrollment and not related to student numbers in special education. And it has some specific guidelines for use. Um, if you're familiar with title grants, your Title I, your Title III, um, it can only be used to supplement and not supplant local expenditures. So um, it is on top of what you already can commit to special education at the local level. On top of that is what IDEA can provide. Um, it cannot be used toward private tuition. Um, IDEA can only be used for the services in the public, um, in the public sector. Um, and um, we, we, meaning as Brian and I are creating um, the grant because um, LADSI um, writes 
much of the IDEA grant, um, we avoid using it for personnel receiving TRS. Um, there used to be a substantial uh, TRS penalty in the state of Illinois for um, assigning IDEA dollars to special ed teachers or speech language pathologists. Um, it was a 40% penalty on top of the cost of the, the um, whatever you put into the grant. That's reduced to 10%, but it's still a penalty. And so there are other ways that we can apply the IDEA grant um, to districts to offset your um, LADSI bills um, and so Brian looks each year to do that so that we can um, avoid having that penalty come into play. Um, and then I just listed some specifics about um, District 96 IDEA dollars. Um, uh, you had $347,859 for Part B and $65,41 for Part C in FY18. We have not received the FY19 allocations yet. Um, we expect them any day now, um, but they are often um, late to arrive in the school year before we need to write the new grant for July 1. Um, so we use, your IDEA dollars are used to directly offset LADSI programming and purchase service costs for District 96 students. Um, I'll go into that in a little bit more detail in, in, a, in a later slide. Um, in terms of your IDEA dollars, the vast majority of those dollars flow through to LADSI for our application towards the cost that you spend at LADSI. Um, a small portion is retained in District 96, um, and that is 2.5% of your IDEA dollars are returned for professional development that Pam and the administration at District 96 coordinates um, for the provision of professional development regarding students with disabilities in your district. So if Pam wants to bring in somebody to speak about ADHD or strategies to address learning disabilities in the general education classroom, that's dollars that she can use towards that. Um, I'm gonna skip in terms of your slides um, down to slide four. So right there, because I think my slides, as I was looking at them, were a little bit out of order. I wanted to cover just an overview of services provided by LADSI and then go back to our um, how IDEA offsets some of those uses that District 96 has. Um, so there's really um, four primary areas that we um, provide services to all of our member districts, uh, all 15 of them, but um, when thinking about that, we, we provide assessment and consultation services to, to the districts. Um, so our co consultation, Pam mentioned the assistive technology coming in to assess or consult on a student that has having communication difficulties or difficulties accessing the curriculum in the classroom due to a, a, a the means of access. I can't read the parent because it's too small, so we need to enlarge it. That would be a, a, a simple way of looking at, at assistive technology. I need to listen to a book instead of read it because I don't. my reading skills don't match my comprehension levels. Um, autism and behavioral consultation as well. We have um, behavioral and autism consultants that um, Pam can access. Um, those are things that are included as part of your membership fee to LADSI, which we alternately call the assessment or the membership fee. Um, and um, so if Pam needs a service, she set, fills out a form and submits it and we assign it to somebody who will then come out and consult with the team. And that is not an extra charge to District 96 to access those services. Um, as you're probably most familiar with, we have our programs that Pam did a great job of describing, as well as our purchase services that um, we provide to districts as needed. Um, and you know, one of those, uh, the, one of the reasons for that purchase service and the, the numbers there is different districts want to approach the hiring of staff in different ways. Um, or you may not need a full-time whatever in your district. And a good example is physical therapy. So um, District 96 is, is small enough that you don't need a full-time physical therapist within your school district. Um, so, so we provide a part-time person to you and then we're able to assign that person part-time somewhere else so we can hire somebody full-time and apply them where needed across the cooperative. Um, and then the other area is just operations and maintenance. I, you know, some of this is just we do have a headquarters. Um, your membership assessment, along with the other 14 districts, supports things like, um, you know, a roof or a HVAC issue. We we have a similar HVAC issue happening today in our district in our headquarters as well. Um, and uh, so just the the running of the of business. 
We also manage all your student and personnel claims. And so as I get into talking about state revenues and reimbursements, um, that's based all on information that Pam sends to LADSI and we coordinate and then submit to the state so that you are getting um, the correct reimbursement back from the state. So we have staff in our business office that are assigned to that task. And then administration, um, myself, Brian, um, our program coordinators who help support the programs and services provided. So we'll go back to slide two. Yep, that's it. Yep. And this kind of breaks down how we use IDEA revenue in detail for LADSI with District 96. So you can see under that assessment, and that would be your membership fee, this, the, the, um, the, the cost for belonging to LADSI, which is um, based upon your district enrollment, your percentage of district enrollment based upon all 15 districts district enrollment. That's how that um, amount is figured. Brian can ask, answer more specific details about that, but it's based upon your district, your, your total district enrollment. Um, things that are included underneath that assessment, as I just mentioned, AT team, autism behavior, operations, maintenance, administration. You can see the gross expense that is assigned based on your percentage of enrollment um, in, in the LADSI, um, the amount that we apply from IDEA funds to that gross expense, and then what your invoice amount winds up being. Um, for purchase services, um, oh, you actually do have a full-time PT. I didn't see that. Okay. <laughs> school psychologist is point six. Um, so, so you see under purchase services, OT, PT, school psych, school social workers, one paraprofessional that would be for a student in our communication development program at LADSI that needs a one-to-one -one aid. Um, early childhood administration and early childhood evaluations. So you can see the total amount there. It is purposely um, these people because we do not hit a TRS penalty with any of those people underneath that, those categories. Um, we didn't talk about early childhood that much, but um, when a student turns two and a half or a student age three to five has a concern, a parent is concerned, a preschool teacher is concerned about the progress that they're making, um, they, they call Pam. And then Pam often will refer that student to LADSI to do an, an early childhood evaluation. We have a team that does a transdisciplinary play-based assessment um, and, um, and then creates that IEP, which Pam comes to that meeting, and then services are planned for that student if they're eligible. And so um, the way early childhood is being assessed moving forward is based on use as opposed to part of the assessment. Prior to this year, uh, prior to next year, I should say, um, early childhood was part of our assessment. So it was just based on your district enrollment as opposed to how much you use LADSI for that. Um, we have a wide range of use when it comes to early childhood evaluations in our um, 13 elementary districts. Um, we have a district that uh, has set up their own early childhood evaluation team and so manages all their early childhood evaluations themselves. We have um, districts like 96 that send us uh, some, 13% uh, of our, or 11% of our total amount every year, or approximately, and we have districts that use us substantially more. They just have more students um, birth to age five that are really needy and need, need a lot more support, just don't have the um, early intervention services that, that, they, that they may need to, to not be at risk when they hit um, kindergarten. Um, so you can see how that's broken down, how the idea is applied, and then you can also see how um, District 96 has accessed LADSI this past year for, uh, or this will actually be projected for next year for our tuition program. So 15 students within the Multi-Needs and CD programs, a couple students in our Emotional Disabilities program. ED Wrap is a service that we provide to our districts for students and families that need, that have a lot of intensive needs, um, where it's not just the student that's having issues, that there's a whole family dynamic. It may be because of low income. It may be because of, um, of a single parent family situation. It may be a bad divorce happening. It may be just something impacting the family dynamic or having an extra person come in to really facilitate connections for the family to the school and the family to the community. So a lot of the work our RAP services do is finding community services and resources for our families so that they can um, be a little bit more secure and more stable so that then the student is more stable coming into the school environment. 
Uh, the PHONO stands for that phonological program at the early childhood level. And ESY is our summer school program. And that is predominantly um, for our students that attend LADSE programs. So your District 96 students that are in multi-needs CD or ED would be the ones referred to our extended school year program, which will be at Pleasantdale this year. And we do have other students also from the district. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so moving into state revenue, this is where it gets even more complex because it was one way this year, and as I'm sure you are all familiar with, evidence-based funding has changed special education reimbursement dramatically moving forward. So what I did was kind of present the world as it was for special education um, with some asterisks saying, here's how the world's going to change for special education revenues moving forward. Um, fund A was a um, all-encompassing kind of formula. It's kind of where, where the vast majority of our students um, in any district um, go, into that, uh, go into that formula and reimbursement is doled out from the state um, from these mandated categoricals. So this followed a very similar fund A formula to IDEA. However, you'll see the asterisk, they've eliminated this fund moving forward and it'll be rolled into evidence-based funding. Um, your general state aid will include dollars that were originally or in the past assigned to fund A. Um, fund B remains, um, that is a private tuition um, fund, uh, mandated categorical. So um, for any student who attends a private therapeutic school, I listed a few there that students at 96 have accessed in the past, um, and there are others out there. Um, you pay initially that tuition cost out at the outset. So they will send a bill to Pam, Pam approves it, it goes to the business office, you pay the bill. Um, the following year, as the state is um, examining expenditures from the prior year, um, you receive a reimbursement back for anything over two times your per capita expenditure operating per pupil expenditure. So I listed that there. Um, it cost last year 13598 for a District 96 student to be educated within District 96. So multiply that by two. That's what you are obligated to pay towards private tuition. Above that, the state reimburses that amount, usually to the full amount, although it's often prorated to some degree. So. Um, Fund E is an orphanage um, fund, which is dedicated for students that are foster uh, students or wards of the state. Um, and then personnel is our next asterisk line. That was a, a rather large line item that we would receive, um, we meaning districts, because I was a district director, so I still think of it as a we. Um, LADSE receives a personal grant for our staff. Um, and as you see, it was $9,000 per one, FTE certified special ed staff. Multiply that times the amount of special ed teachers, social workers, um, school psychologists, speech pathologists that you have. It's a nice um, bit of revenue that you would you would receive each year, including the amounts per paraprofessional also. So that was a claim that um, LADSE would um, run through consultation with 96 each summer and submit to the state we get the money back, that, or the, and then the money would go directly to your FRIS account. So it would go directly into District 96 account at the um, state level. That has been not eliminated, but rolled into the evidence-based funding model as well. So that will appear under gener within your general state aid monies that you get in the future. So while we still need to track the personnel for the state, they've asked us to still keep track of that figure for um, uh, reporting purposes that money will not be coming through any longer. Um, transportation is another claim. Um, we've actually usually gotten an, um, most of our money for special education transportation back from um, that we, so the cost of transporting the student on Grand Prairie Transit is reimbursed back to the district. Um, and Brian's actually been looking at ways to increase that, that, that claim this past year. Um, and then summer school was usually a very small amount of money, meaning like, uh, thousand dollars somewhere in that neighborhood it was not a very significant amount of money but that claim has also been rolled into evidence-based funding so just wanted to kind of highlight that because there are some pretty large changes that are happening that will impact the district moving forward looking so specific a quick oh, yep. question about yes so that um when you say um and the first line you said 85 15 formula similar to idea but what does that mean exactly similar to sure. idea so the total pot of money that the federal government would assign to, to the state and then the state deals out to districts is complicated, but um, based upon a formula of saying we are going to give money based on 85% of your total enrollment and 15% of your low income enrollment. So um, 
again, it's 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 a rather complicated, more descriptive formula. I'd be happy to to gather that information. Um, I've looked into it myself, and it just it's complicated. But that is. The, the point is they want to recognize how large your school district is, but also recognize that low income students factor heavily into special education often. So if you calculate, just, um, just to follow up on that, if you calculated the amount of money per student mm -hmm. in, a, in a school district from, um, from the federal government, which for us looks like it's about $200 per student, roughly, um, and you were to rank that by district by the percentage of low-income students in the district. So if we looked at the schools that belong to the Ladsey Co-op. Sure. So we're, we're at $200 per student. Where are you getting that 200 uh, from? Where is that 340,000 divided by 1,700. Okay. Roughly, is that right? Um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, which seems like actually a very small amount of money compared to the, the numbers we were seeing here. But yeah. um, if you looked at that number for other districts, mm -hmm. would you see then, I think what, what, I'm, what I'm hearing from you is that the districts that have a larger percentage of low-income students than we do will be getting more money mm -hmm. yes. and the, per student. Yes. And the districts that have a lower percentage of low-income students will be getting less money per larger student. Larger districts get more money, districts with larger percentages of low-income students So, But by per student, more. it would be essentially just ranked on the percentage of low-income students. I believe so. Okay. But you are getting into the more complicated math that I would want to sit down and really analyze. But yes, that is okay. my understanding. Okay. <laughs> and not mine. <laughs> That's why I brought Brian. <laughs> so, um, Moving forward into just some specifics, I just literally went on to the state website. I mentioned Frizz. That's a, a, a um, Inqu you can do a Frizz inquiry and find out what your mandated categorical reimbursements are from the state. So you can see what you received for FY17 and what's happening in FY18 based on the evidence-based funding that went into place. Um, so, um, you know, I don't, um, you know, I noted that EBF comes here. I just kind of included that for your information. Um, and it's usually a year behind as well, so it's a little bit hard to gather. So FY17 is going to rec represent what was happening in the district in FY16. Um, because as Pam and I were looking at it, she was going, wow, we had a lot of transportation in FY16. So like, I don't remember that. But then you go, to, go back to FY16, you had a significant higher number of students in private facilities. That bumps up your transportation costs. And so then it made sense of going, oh, yeah, we were transporting a lot of kids. Now we're transporting less kids. And that's good for kids because that means they're coming back to closer to their homeschool community. Um, but it changes your reimbursement. So just a few other revenues that you receive. I mentioned the two and a half percent. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, I, I was just noting that um, on your previous slide, where you're saying the things that are moved to EBF, the, the add up to, for fiscal 17, they add up to significantly less than right. what we appear to be receiving in evidence-based funding. So. There is more to evidence-based funding than just those mandated sure. categoricals. So mm -hmm. it's also your general state aid that you're receiving. and. That will then get into complicated math that I don't quite understand of how the state is assigning based on the level of your school and um, you know the tier and and those sort of things. So that's the numbers that have been presented publicly at the state mm -hmm. level. So uh, yeah, I see that def discrepancy for sure, and it looks like something's you know is, is, yeah the total debt at the bottom just to be clear represents the ones that are still you're still receiving and the evidence-based funding. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, there's other things in that general state aid. So um, I guess I'm wondering then, is there any way to break that out to get an idea about you know, net gain or net loss from those other so categories? Option, no, I can't tell. I can't yeah. tell from, yeah. I, I don't so know. So we know our general state aid evidence. number. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, you're not supposed to, it's hold harmless. So you're not going to get less than you did in the past, but I don't know, I can't speak to how much more you're going to get. We're not, we are not in a position to get more. Mm -hmm. So we, the hold harmless amount is the amount that we believe we will continue to receive. Mm -hmm. And that speaks to the adequacy target that we've communicated about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then other revenues. Um, I mentioned the 2.5% of professional development dollars that um, is, um, is uh, kept at District 96 for professional de development activities. There's also this um, 
uh, proportionate share dollars, and for uh, FY18, it was uh, close to six thousand um, dollars. These are services that the federal government mandates be allocated towards students um, within District 96 boundaries, um, stu students who attend school within District 96 boundaries. They. An important they point is they can. Attend a private parochial school, right? Yes, yeah. they, they attend a. I'm sorry, thank you, Martha. So the private parochial school is located within District 96 boundaries or their home school. So um, it's a, a bit of a complicated formula. Again, this one I understand a lot better because I've had to do a lot of work in this in this particular area. Um, but the idea grant is based on your um, your your district enrollment, and that will include that can include the parochial schools that reside within your district, and that's how the funding is allocated. It's not allocated based on where you pay your property taxes to. So a student can live in Chicago, attend a parochial school in in District 96, and they are they are entitled to part of your idea dollars for that. Now it's a very small amount, and it's an amount that um, Pam actually has a meeting every year to. Um, with any interested parties to say, here's the dollars that we have, and um, here's how they can be applied to um, services towards students with disabilities. Um, and it depends from district to district, district and director to director how they um, decide to allocate those dollars. But um, again, for you. And that is fairly typical for elementary districts to provide those speech services. Um, but some districts have a significantly higher amount if they have, um, I came from a district this past year that had four high schools um, that were parochial schools within our district boundaries and that we had a significant amount of money that we needed to um, allocate. Um, Medicaid is a, a pretty significant um, revenue for District 96 as well. And this is, um, uh, we are able to claim services um, for students who are low income and eligible for Medicaid who have disabilities. So if a speech therapist works with a student directly who has a speech language disability and is eligible for Medicaid, she can record that time, claim that time, and then we receive money back. We, meaning District 96, receives money back directly. That is money that goes directly to District 96 to be applied to special education programming as, as you see here. Can I add some real quick? Sure. Um, I've been working with our provider, the same provider that you use, and one thing that we've never done in the past, none of our member districts or LADS is, um, those students who are receiving sports services, uh, Medicaid sports services those days, their transportation is also claimable at almost $25 a, a day. So we are starting to, we're going to retro it from the beginning of the school year. Uh, we're sending all the attendance sheets from Grand Prairie Transit to our Medicaid fee-for-service provider, which you guys use as well, and they will automatically apply those claims to your district so that revenue should be going up in the near future as well. Um, and finally, Lansing Rental, um, you receive some revenue from us um, that um, is uh, for hosting a classroom. So you've been gracious enough to host the classroom at Hollywood, and um, and we are so appreciative of that. And um, for that, we um, uh, allocate ten thousand dollars per room that's rented, and then thirteen dollars per average daily enrollment um, for students. So if a student's there for the whole year, then you would get $1,300 and then it's prorated based on the attendance. It winds up based on our student enrollment being about $20,000 of total revenue. And that is um, assessed to the program. So it's um, if, if you have students attending the program, then you're a little bit paying yourself for that money. But if you don't have students attending, then you are um, getting that revenue from, from other districts that are, that are allocated that. So. Okay, moving to the expense side of things. Um, you know, obviously personnel, as is true in the world of school districts everywhere, is the largest expense that, um, that you as District 96 see in the world of special ed that we at LADSE see. We are primarily a personnel organization. Um, so teachers, pathologists, um, social work, psych, <coughs> paras, um, administrators. Other expenses that you incur, that private tuition I mentioned, that where you get that bill, it's usually a monthly bill that you pay, uh, rate per day on and then you get that reimbursement 
long after the fact from the state. Um, and then special transportation, um, um, the, the bills for Grand Prairie, again, that you get um, uh, re reimbursement back for. And then on the final slide, I just included, I, I literally took this off your budget. I created this slide. So um, this is the one where I'm going to defer to others to provide more expertise to it. But I took it, I pulled their budget off of your website and kind of looked at that, the line items that apply um, very significantly to special education. Um, I know a question came up today or recently about whether those LADSI costs are built into these costs. That actually is a different line item that I wasn't able to locate on your budget. But so that is the cost to LADSI. I don't believe, Martha, and that's, I think we came to that conclusion, is separate from this amount. But your mandated categorical reimbursement that you receive, your Medicaid revenue that you receive, those things, those are items that do offset these, these amounts. And um, the only other thing I just wanted to reference is that um, included in your packet that you received was a preliminary budget breakdown. Mm -hmm. um, and it's awful tiny, so I didn't put it up on a slide. To, and it goes into a lot more detail than what I provided. I took from this sheet in order to create some of my spreadsheets. Um, but it just shows you um, the, um, you know, the breakdown of, of how District 96 um, accesses LADSI and how they use LADSI. Um, really briefly, um, you'll notice at the bottom this blue box with indirect costs and restructuring cost shift. Um, one of my tasks that I was given as I came into LADSI this year was to um, examine ways that we could restructure how costs are allocated at LADSI to districts um, to um, address some equity issues that were coming up from our, our member districts. And that relates specifically to the idea that our assessment um, was based on your district enrollment. And that automatically meant that the larger the district, the more you paid to our LADSI assessment. And where that's a bit counterintuitive is that our larger districts tend to have a little bit more capacity to serve the students with special needs. Um, and that's certainly true of when you think of Lyons Township High School, um, they have over 4,000 students. Um, they don't have any LADSI programs. We provide some purchase services towards them and some other supports. Um, but I think from our larger districts are saying, hang on, we don't you know, is this really fair because a really small district needs you more, is accessing you more, and yet paying the least amount towards our overall assessments. So Brian and I partnered together um, with Sherry support as well as, um, uh, you know, some others on the directing board to um, examine different ways of approaching that. And the model that we um, um, developed and was approved by the directing board takes a look at kind of basically creating an administrative overhead to our purchase services and programs. So taking some of the costs that had always been in um, the membership assessment and saying not all of that should be in the membership assessment. Actually, when I think about um, um, our program coordinator for um, um, school psychology and professional development. She does, she does work for all of our districts, but she also spends a lot of her time working with the school psychologist. So, should, so a portion of her salary should be um, assessed to districts that purchase our school psychologists. And so um, that's done on an FTE basis. So the more you purchase, the more you're going to pay. We truly tried to make it a, if you're going to access us some more, you may need to pay a little bit more overhead to cover those costs. So um, that's a very brief overview of that. Martha's heard a lot more about it. So um, anyway, I will stop now and let Pam and I answer any questions that you have. I have a question on slide 10. Can I go back to 10? Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Which we don't have the numbers. That's it, right, right there. This one? Okay. I noticed there aren't any numbers for this current calendar year. Can you tell me about sure. what's happening now? So <laughs> this year, I did write some of that down um, because, again, ISBE always looks at things um, a couple of years in the rear. So um, take a look at that. So our numbers right now, private day. Um, we have 12 students in private day and 20 in public day. We had. Um, for private day, we had four students um, who were evaluated, and through their evaluation and their needs by the IP team were determined that they required private day, and we had two move into the district. 
so those numbers increased. And um, for our LADSI programs too, we had three move in um, requiring LADSI or SASA programs. So can you give those me numbers a percentage are always because now you're giving me wrong numbers. Can you tell me about what? I don't have the percentages for can you. Can right you now. give those to us? Sure, Thank I could look you. and try to get those. It's for difficult. You. I mean, I understand what you're saying that there's mm -hmm. an increase, but it's hard to compare sure. when they're wrong mm -hmm. numbers versus mm -hmm. percentages. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Have a couple more questions on, on the on the expense side. Um, sure. So thanks, first of all, for putting those all together is very helpful. Um, so you have, you, there's two two tables that have the expenses. One is the um, the LADC detail, yes. which I think you have about 1. 1. 1.6 million total, and then net of idea it's 1.25 million. Right. And then there's also at the at the end of the presentation you have the local expenses. Um, which is five million, roughly. Um, so the the sum of those two is is, is six point two million. Um, is that is that all of the special education expenses that we incur as a district? I mean, does that include? Uh, you mentioned transportation. Mm -hmm. Does that include the transportation cost? Because uh, <coughs> I don't see that. Um, it's not going to be all inclusive. And again, that's because I didn't when I was creating this. For instance, I didn't pull from. Administrative. There was a. There's an administrative line in the budget. There's administrative salaries. Yeah, uh -huh. exactly. I didn't know what. When I was looking at the budget, I didn't have that level of detail to be able to pull that information. So I don't. I don't believe this reflects the last slide. The special and local expenses reflects all the costs. The local costs that okay. District 96 has. And I'm okay. sure that's not difficult to okay. to put together. Um, the the LADSI breakdown is is uh, complete. True, is okay. Complete, yes. Well, would it be possible? Uh, special education transportation, Brian, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe is um, reimbursed at approximately 80% yes. or so. We do get reimbursed back for special education transportation. Right, I see that. I see that in the um, in the revenue side. I see that um, revenue, but I don't see it, any expense on the expense side. So I'm wondering, is it possible to actually uh, um, sort of add, would it, would it look at anything we might have missed, like administrative cost or transportation or I don't know, there's legal expenses that are associated with special ed, right. but probably not in there. Is it possible to get a sort of a, a complete um, list of everything that might not be in there so we have a sort of complete overview? I think a lot of it, has, I mean, a, a lot of the LADSI stuff is there. No, yeah, I'm not, yeah, so I'm not talking about LADSI. More, more, more question for our, for our, for our just looking through my head. I think. Yeah. Can do that? Okay. Yeah, and so, you know, also, like, I included social work here um, as a line item because a lot of social work time is spent mm -hmm. on students with IEPs, but not all of it. Right. Mm -hmm. So how Pam yeah, and difficult it's, to, a, to it's a tricky formula, but um, some are very clear and some are, are not as clear. So, um, but I will leave that to, to Rob and Pam and okay. Martha put together. Yeah, that'd be very helpful. And, and then just on the, on the revenue side, it looks like you've got the, the 340000 350000 from IDEA and then... From the state, you had a couple million dollars, um, but that included the 1.8 million, something that included the um, general state aid, mm -hmm. and right. you're not sure about how much that general state aid is. Yeah, they don't, um, that I've been able to find, I haven't seen a general right state aid amount which says this part is personnel and this part is okay. um, summer school and this part is, yeah. Well, just, just to sort of, but if we assume all of that is going to special education, assume 100% of it. So I think and this year, because of the mm -hmm. new change in evidence-based funding, they, from what I've heard, mm -hmm. uh, the research years I've done, is they they put that money in general state this year. However, that's because they didn't have an account code and a new line item to call it the base funding minimum, which mm -hmm. I think in your FRS account there'll be a line for general state aid next year, okay. and now all of that stuff in evidence-based funding based. So that will be broken out separately Maybe next year from what in I subsequent years okay mm -hmm. but this year was that kind of happened okay. extremely fast for everyone and they just threw it in the general state so if you go back to then last year's number let's just take that as a baseline i think you mm -hmm. said it was 1.1 1 .1, was it 1.1 1 .1 million or something like that for mm -hmm. 2017 yes. plus the idea money that's 1.5 so it looks like roughly speaking if our expenditures are six million dollars or, or somewhat more than that um we're getting reimbursed for about a quarter of that amount, mm -hmm. basically from either the state or the federal government, and the rest of it is local is local cost. Mm -hmm. Public, public yeah, okay. property taxes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And just one thing I want to mention, when I go back, Sherry, and look at those percentages for this year, mm -hmm. it may be a little off from the numbers I shared with you right now when you look <laughs> at it, because 
all these numbers are based on the December 1 count, so I will need to go back to our December 1 count in order to it yeah, for it okay. to look. Yeah. So in terms of the restructuring that you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, and I'm guessing as well, District 96 compared to being, being relatively on the smaller side compared to some of the larger districts, I would, and I think I've seen that in other uh, documents, that our expenses for LADSI are going up. Is that correct? Do you have that information? I think 96 I is actually not finish, a... But if you give me maybe 10 seconds, I could probably give you a quick... We're really yeah. close, but so it's very close. Yeah, it's we not a dramatic shift. Like a much there, there were some districts where there was a dramatic shift of, mm -hmm. of savings from um, before the restructure to after. There were, there were several districts that had a dramatic shift increase. Yours was much yeah, more like pretty, pretty flat. Neutral. Yeah. When we say dramatic, we're talking about less than 3%. I mean, yes. mm -hmm. it's dramatic. Yeah. We, we feel it's dramatic because it goes up. But yeah. Some districts that yeah. spend $3 million with LASI and their bill is going up $80,000 because of the restructuring alone. You guys, if I recall, were very uh, under, 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 per, under percentage. Yeah. Less than 1%. I seem to recall there was some yeah. increase. Yeah. I don't know the number off the top of my yep. head, but there was Actually, some. you guys have a, a higher kind of enrollment than some of our other districts. Mm -hmm. So um, you could be saving quite a bit on the uh, assessment. Last year, you, this year, we billed you $200,000 gross expense for your assessment, next year we're proposing or, or, or estimating $92,000. Right. So a big decrease in your membership assessment, increase in, the, in some of the indirect costs, and you add a couple students in there as well. But it was pretty, pretty, pretty close. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have one question. Do we still have a, um, I'll call it a large percentage of our LASI classroom students from D96? Because I remember we did have a significant number last year. Is that still the case? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Do we know how many? I think there may be one or six or seven yeah, kids and, in the classroom. And one or two are from other districts. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. The majority of the students are, are from yeah, D96. Yeah, that's how it was last year. Mm -hmm. it stayed pretty much the same. I don't know if that will be the same for next year, though, right, because right. it there, there will be age-level grouping, and so that may look different for next okay. year. I'm just going to throw a plug in there too. So every classroom that we rent, we pay the district ten thousand dollars plus thirteen hundred dollars for every one point oh eight of a yeah, student, even if it's your own student. Yeah, so it is a good little revenue source. We're always short on classrooms, so I'm just plugging in. It. <laughs> <laughs> it's tricky for us because we're short on space. So it's a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's it's important. Yeah. Yeah. Brian, based on the that lack of change in our total LADC bill. Would you say that, does that let one say that we're using an average amount of services or is that, yeah, am I say, wrong in making that no. assumption? I mean, you guys are purchasing, you know, about eight purchase, like support services from us, a total of eight people. And you guys have, um, gosh, I mean, almost 20, a little bit over 20 kids 25 kids with us so I think it's really average and I think why it shows that you guys are using us properly and we're billing for it properly is when we did that restructuring it kind of did balance yeah. out there are some smaller districts that were that went up you know sixty thousand dollars because they just their district size didn't match up for their usage and your guys's district size is matching up with your usage at Lansing compared to the other districts so Brian, I, I was able to locate a document for November. So that was when the, the restructuring was just being sort of initially oh, discussed. The variance was 16,172 with a variance decrease of 1.07%. There you go. Mm -hmm. So, so, so like those we numbers said, have changed some sure. yeah. since November. Yeah. Since then we've had um, Pam make recommendations for what she needs next year for District 96 students um, from LADSI. That was and also comparing. This current year's budget, what I gave you is next yeah. year's budget with health increases. Yeah, this, and the, increases. what we gave you is a more accurate estimation of what your bill will be for next year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. No, this is sure. This is very helpful. Yeah. I mean, thank you, Dan. Yeah, thank you, guys. <laughs> and everybody from Lansing. I mean, you did the work. So. Right. <laughs> We're just listening. <laughs> I'll pass it on. Then. So uh, Rich is not here, so I'll just um, uh, ask um, Mr. Holmes to maybe um, review the uh, tentative budget update. Okay, so you have a 15-page uh, tentative budget packet, and um, 
It contains historical data, um, the tentative budget for next year and for, for additional years of um, projections. Um, before I go on any further, I just want to point out that it is a fluid document. This is as, as of April, and some changes may, may come as we find out what our um, property taxes are going to get and other various changes. And then, so if you want to, if you look at page three and six of the document, you'll see that salaries and benefits are the biggest cost driver. And those are mostly um, driven by the collective bargaining agreements. And um, I used 3% uh, as, as a conservative increase on that. And then all other increases, I presume, would be at the CPI of the last two years, which is 2.1. And then, you know, how are you going to pay for this? Well, the revenues, as you can see on page two and six, the biggest revenue sources are property taxes. And as you know, the Riverside District 96 is pretty well built up. So most of that will come from CPI increases, which I assumed going forward would be 2.1%. And um, so then you have salaries going up, salaries and benefits going up 3% but revenue is only going up 2.1%, so how are you going to pay for that? Well, one of the ways you can pay for that is um, attrition. So you've got six certified staff retiring at the end of this year and three non-certified. And then the other ways, how do you reduce the cost is by um, judicious spending. So when I worked with, um, when I saw the budgets from the principals, they, they all look at their budgets very carefully and they're only asking for um, expenditures that they will need that will help their students. And then when I look, when I spoke to um, and work with um, with Merrill, Merrill's proposing a $200,000 $200, decrease in materials and a 50000 decrease in purchase services because um, the one-time curriculum adoption is going to be eliminated next year. And as you saw Pam from Pam, some demonstration that she's working very diligently with LADSI to make sure that the district is charged properly and is getting the best possible services. And then if you look at Don Tefano's um, presentation last week, he worked very diligently with um, the tech steering committee and set up some very thoughtful um, pr purchase cycles for classroom technologies. And then, like I said, um, principals such as Casmira were very diligent in their presentations for budgets. And then as far as capital is concerned, I added the Blythe Roof Project replacement for next year. I did not add the Ames Project at this point, um, but please note that I, uh, the $3.5 million loan from working cash was to transportation was paid back. So there's $3.5 million in working cash that could be used for projects. And next year, the $2.4 million loan from the operation maintenance fund will be paid back by the transportation fund. So that money could be used for projects. Um, so these funds could be used for AIMS projects and other ones. And then finally, I just wanted to point out that the administrative cap went up 9%, which is above the 5% threshold. That's because the CSBO salary was added to the cap. So at the next meeting in May, the, um, the board will pass a resolution to publish, to publicly notify the public that they will be doing administrative cap amendment at the June, I think, was it the June 20th board meeting? And uh, last year, I think it was a 16% increase in the administrative cap where the board did the same resolution. Are there any questions? So, just the big takeaway looks to me like from, from what you have here is that similar to what you showed us last time, revenues are kind of flat. Mm -hmm. The expenses are going up, and for the next year or two, we're going to be slightly positive. 
without considering any new capital expenditures other than what you've assumed here for the that depreciation mm -hmm. and right. the play-through. And then after that, you show us basically the year after next starting to go deficit spending, and that then accumulates rapidly after that is kind of what you're showing here. If things aren't changed, that's If things correct. aren't changed, basically. Right. Any other questions for Mr. Holmes? No, thanks very much. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, and then. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take oh, yeah. over for Rich here. Um, the next item is facilities advisory committee update. Um, last Friday, we had our first Ames visioning committee meeting. Um, we met at Ames with um, Carrie and three of her staff and a large group of Ames teachers and administrators. And it was, a, it was a really interesting, slightly stressful for me, I don't know why, but really interesting three hours. Um, uh, first of all, I just wanna mention that the people that were there were incredibly engaged and uh, enthusiastic. <coughs> and I mean, they, they wouldn't stop talking and offering ideas. So it was a really engaged group. I was really impressed. Um, I also thought it was a neat to note that one of the teachers who was involved is also a District 96 resident, so we had that perspective. Um, I noted, I found out that two of the people in the room were also school board members on different, you know, in, in other towns. So that was a really, uh, it was neat to have that perspective as well. So basically what we did at the meeting, um, we didn't talk about space. And Carrie was very clear that when we started to talk about space that we were not to be talking about space. So the first meeting was what she followed, like the whole form follows function. So what we were talking about was who, who are the people that use AIMS? Um, how is it used? How, how do teachers teach? How do they, um, what is their, their, the best modes of learning for the students? So it was just a lot, of, a lot of interesting stuff about how teachers use their classrooms, how they use the, you know, I'm using the word space, we weren't supposed to, how they use the space, how they move. Um, uh, Martha was there, she could add anything else, but I, basically we, we did three hours of talking about who's there, you know, teachers, community members, students, how the space is used, um, the challenges of the population that uses the school and what we need to talk about. It was just really neat to listen to the teachers talk about how they teach, and through that you could see the architects were really picking up on, um, you know, the space side of it, although we weren't talking about space. Um, and it was neat to see them list out the things that were really important to them, like what defines the Ames community and like in the way they teach and learn. And um, it was, I thought, very informative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would echo the same. Um, it was, you know, as I said, the architects very specifically challenged the group not to say, you know, she said, you think you were invited here to come talk about whether or not we should build two rooms or four rooms or whatever. And she said, you're really here to talk about student learning and what, um, not just students, but what, the community needs. You know, how often is the building used by the community? Who uses it, and for what, and how is it when they come here? And um, it was. Uh, I just agree with Linda. It was the group was really engaged. The group was really thoughtful. Um, it really speaks to that idea of, uh, you know, changing a school structure for the future. And I know this group has talked about that when we look back at when buildings were. Um, renovated when they were added on to and we look back sort of at the long history of District 96 you kind of have that moment of like this is really an opportunity here a moment here to really be really thoughtful really insightful and make decisions about uh, where where we ought to go right and so we will reconvene in I believe a week or so yeah next week I don't remember yeah. but that is when the word space will allow to be used and we will be um, you know following up I'm not exactly sure how, but mm -hmm. following up that. But I do think, it, I mean, I just thought it was really interesting as not an educator nor an architect to be in the room um, to hear the questions, like just asking about curriculum and how does that, like explain what that curriculum is like, like what are the students doing, what, mm -hmm. you know, so, and I even the teachers were even like, oh, I can't believe they're asking these kinds of questions. Or um, So they also asked about like, you know, like if the teachers were talking about things that they, they would love to incorporate moving forward. And it was just a really good brainstorm uh, session. And I, I, I personally got a lot out of it. And I think our architects did as well. And I thought it was a really good um, starting point to get like the pulse of what Ames is like. And um, 
I think the people who were selected to be a part of the committee were incredibly uh, helpful and engaged. So, mm -hmm. so it was exciting to go forward. Yeah. Any questions? Because I could really answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Martha, can you add something about how some of the the Ames community staff was added? How were those selected? So we picked a teacher per grade level. So it was uh, kindergarten through fifth grade, one for each grade level. And then we had a special education teacher represented and a mu the music teacher. So we kind of wanted to rep represent the sort of non-traditional classroom um, users. And then Todd Gearman as the principal was also there. The Really Todd and I kind of picked the group. Um, and by intention and by design, pick people that have been there a really long time, people that are very new to Ames, um, perhaps people that are more traditional in their approach, and perhaps those that are more innovative in their approach. So it was really, I think, a very balanced group. I think what I would say is it was a very student-centered group. Of course, that's what our teachers are, but really, again, really spoke to, and that was really the challenge and the request from the architect team, too. It was like, talk to us about kids. Talk to us about kids and student learning. and. Um, that was really valuable, and I thought the teachers did a great job with that. But it was a very um, balanced. I mean, there are teachers that are new this year, and there are teachers that have been there for years, yeah. 15, 20, perhaps, yeah, years. You're just talking about um, curriculum for the most part, for the three hours, is that kind of? No, that was a smaller part. It was more so um, who's using the space, how the space is being used, um, the models of learning that are used at Ames. Um, I mean, curriculum was a small part, but it was definitely a piece of it. But I mean, a lot of it was just, I don't know how to describe it in well, a way. It depends what you mean by curriculum. Yeah. So was, they, yeah. they literally wanted us to list every curriculum tool, right? So the math and focus, mm -hmm. the ready gen, every tool used by special education students. Like they, they create a comprehensive list of the curriculum tools. So I think sometimes when we think about curriculum, we think about those tools, those things we've purchased. Um, but they also talked a lot about how students learn. So one of the examples, you know, that one of the teachers brought that was, I thought, very insightful is how children, we want them to make choices every day. So, right, so I can read with my small group, I can go read with my teacher, I can go and put, you know, headphones on and listen to a story, or I can go and work with word building tiles. And so all of that, in that description, you realize that takes space, right? And that's how I use, teachers use a classroom. And, but it was, so it was sort of both the what and the how of, of curriculum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and how they want things to feel. So I think there was an inspirational. So, so people talk about they want the school to feel welcoming. They want the school to feel very inclusive. They, you know, so some of those, what I would call sort of more of those soft or inspirational mm -hmm. terms, mm -hmm. were also very mm -hmm. much discussed. Mm -hmm. You know, what does that feel like to say you want your school to feel welcoming? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, people are challenged to think about those things. The the one thing I found, like I said, I'm not an educator. So the one thing I found very interesting was when they were talking about like how their classrooms look. So, and there's teachers, like you said, were so different. Like, well, you walk into my classroom and my classroom is noise. Like, and I think they described it as like um, productive noise or something, you know, mm -hmm. where, you know, and then other teachers were like, ah, oh, you know, I, I don't know. It was just really neat to see all the different variations of learning and teaching and um, how space is used. And it really did come down to like a really, um, I don't know, just a very collaborative process that I felt really did inform the architects in, you know, what's going on at Ames, like, what happens here. So, like, so here, this came up at the meeting as an example, and I think it's a challenge, but it's something I've heard from probably all five of our principals, is schools as a gathering place, schools as a community, so is there a place to gather your, for, your full school community? Um, you don't do that often, but it's really nice when you can do it. Um, so that was something that something we have to problem solve for. I, we, I don't know that we can do it, but we need to, to think about it. When the teachers were speaking, was there a difference kind of from as the ages of the kids increased, as the grade levels went, or was it more unique to the teachers and how they use space? Or was there kind of a continuum of the younger kids need to have more mobility? So I would say, probably from a kindergarten perspective, there was um, some conversation about just play spaces, you know. Um, but everybody talked about play and everybody talked about movement and everybody talked mm -hmm. about choice, you know. So 
So this idea that you don't just sit at your desk, even if you're a fifth grader compared to a first grader, you don't just sit at your desk or at a small table all day. You really, you know, I, I think teachers do a great job and that's why I also had that more of like, this is why we need to listen to the teachers, right? They're the ones living between those walls every day and working with children. Um, yeah, there, there were th those themes felt very common, regardless of the grade level. Movement, choice, um, flexibility, welcoming, inclusive. Like, I, I think if I were to sort of try to gather up the, the terms mm -hmm. that sort of came up and popped up, they recorded a lot of it. They um, kept a very careful Google Doc of it. Yeah. So I think we'll have a very good record of, of all of it as as we move forward. And that's part of their process. And that's the part of their methodology. will continue to evolve through these yeah. additional mm -hmm. meetings. Yeah. Great. Any yeah. Uh, any other so questions? I, I guess well, it was mentioned that one the, we were soliciting from the community ideas for how the community would use the facility more. I think we've talked in the past in general that the District 96 facilities aren't used to the fullest extent by the community. Do we have, I mean, what were there any big recommendations behind that or any big changes or any thoughts that came out of that? I think this was more of an inventory. So, um, you know, they certainly talked about like parks and recreation, but then Girl Scouts mm -hmm. and Boy Scouts and before and after care. Mm -hmm. and so even their list became more comprehensive than I think if I created the list. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it wasn't so much now how will they use it, what do they need. It was really let's make sure we're attentive to the groups that, that use mm -hmm. this, a school. Yeah, I don't think there was any like recommendations of how we can better use the facilities for community use. I think it was just at this point talking about like, uh, I mean, we were even talking about like the the PTA has no space to store anything or hold a meeting when they need to, you know. So um, all the groups that are using it were talked about, and it was talked. I mean, Parks and Rec does use Ames for basketball and um, things like that during the week. So those those were all mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure any like. I don't think we're at the point of a recommend like that okay, part yet. Sure. Any other questions? Mm. All right, thanks. That was interesting. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, so next, next we move on to the uh, policy committee. Dan? Okay, I will defer to Martha for the first item. Sure, and I can defer to Pam Shaw for it. Um, so we, <laughs> we have a um, behavior intervention committee that meets regularly to review um, per the requirements of the policy to review this with a team that looks specifically at misconduct by students with disabilities, um, making sure that our policies are appropriate. Um, the ISBE guidelines for students with disabilities and that we have appropriate um, information to parents and that we're So it's an annual requirement, so this is our, <coughs> yeah. Okay, uh, let's see, and on the second item, uh, with, uh, Martha and I, as well as uh, uh, Jeff, we've had a lot of discussions in the interim since our initial discussion of uh, the potential for changing the attendance policy. I think we wanted to try to put an emphasis on uh, making the language clearer and more reflective of how the policy is being implemented. Um, you know, to that end, when we've talked about, you know, attendance areas, uh, it's not necessarily something that reflects how the policy as it stands now has been implemented in the past completely. Uh, so I think we, we've uh, have some drafts here that, that are in front of the board members. Um, and in particular, I think one of the options we talk about, uh, something that we haven't emphasized as much in the past, of so having the transfer within the district as opposed to a waiting list option, which hasn't been used to the fullest uh, extent. Or, you know, really, I don't know, Martha, what were your words on that? Well, so I think um, the idea is that perhaps what families are really, rather than being put on a waiting list, if let's say you didn't, your child wasn't attending the school of your preference, is that rather than keeping a waiting list, it's really a request for a transfer. Transfer that, you know, doesn't mean that that could also be granted immediately, but that, again, because some families may put themselves on a waiting list, two years later, they don't want to be on that list anymore. They've... Right you know, acclimated to the mm -hmm. school that they're currently enrolled in. So, but if they did on a certain year want to go to a different school, then it's a request for a transfer. So I think that we felt that that was a way that really simplified by getting really to the same 
goal of being able to have communication and honor or acknowledge families that may want a change of school. Like first come or whoever applied first or I think it would be based on you know, the, like three the of enrollment, them. right? So um, again, in but my two years time, one. We haven't yeah. haven't looked at any long list of families. It's usually just a few, families. right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, no, we've also had a lot of discussion and uh, some early uh, early dry test runs of the uh, the algorithm that we've spoken about in the past that we're trying to model after uh, a district down, down in California. Uh, again, with the idea that uh, in using uh, such an algorithm or, or implementing the policy in such a way that we're trying to efficiently allocate the resources that are available to us, but then also provide options to to students that you know, are efficient to their to their commute and their distance from the school. Uh, and so, I think um, you know, after our dry runs, it's. Well, the re results that we're seeing, I guess, in the early going is, is that it's fairly similar to what we see in our current allocations. There are some changes, but um, I don't know, Jeff, can you speak a little more to the algorithm? Uh, yeah, so um, um, as Stan said, this district has been running the algorithm uh, just in the background to see what it looks like. and. Uh, um, if you work, if you run the algorithm where they have been running it without any sort of constraint, one of the big questions is constraints on, on, on school capacity. And if you just ignore that, you know, constraint and pretend that each school can accommodate as many students as actually live close to it, then then you get um, uh, looks. Inter what's interesting to me is that it looks like Blythe would have, um, you know, even right now with enrollment, 28 students. Um, just looking at the, you know, in kindergarten. In kindergarten. Right which is already sort of more than a one section mm -hmm. school just by closest distance. So um, what's also interesting is the sheer number, I think Martha can address this, but the number of students we have registered for kindergarten already is very large, I think, <coughs> mm -hmm. relative to what we've had in the past at this time. So we assume we'll pick up more students over the summer, which we mm -hmm. usually do. Mm -hmm. So Could we have 145 a, children currently in kindergarten. We have 143 registered wow. to attend kindergarten next school year. Um, so I've, I was joking, I'm like, does that mean our communication's gotten better and families are all registered and <laughs> enrolled? Um, or is it that it's going to be a much larger class and families aren't, aren't here yet? So, And that's always one of our unknowns that we, we address and try to certainly address through policy also. Um, we, we name a June 30th time frame in the, in the policy. That's something that's been in our current policy um, that we would let families know, we say just after or on, I have to look back, um, June 30th in terms of the school that they would attend for right. kindergarten. So, yeah. On or before June 30th. So, Dan, is it fair to say that we basically have sort of two questions before us right now? One is the, the first page, the policy, the student assignment policy, mm -hmm. and the wording for that. And then, and then, the, then the, the second thing is the wording for the exhibit that, that goes along with that policy. Sort of proposals have been made for changes in both of those, right? That's mm -hmm. what we're facing. Correct. Yes. Uh, All right. Any questions? Tell me about the wording policy. The second paragraph, like the goal of assigning students to schools near their homes. No, he initially, I don't know, maybe this is last year, talked about shortest walking distance, and that's much more specific. Um, it's just a well, question I have. Are right. you looking at that when you say idea, near that your is home? The algorithm. And so that's, that's right. I'm just wondering does the is. policy, should it reflect that, or should it be more broad? I don't know. From what I can tell, what the, what the California school does, and I think what our lawyer says is the policy should be sort of general. General. And just say we're following this sort of methodology and without getting into the minutiae. Yeah, I was just wondering because I know we had that um, talk like trying so to figure that, out how to We talked it. about, we I did see. talk very specifically about this issue of near, yeah. near your home as opposed to, to closest to like your home. Like what if you're in between really Ames thing. and Blythe, what does that mean? Right. Or across the street or, you know. Right. <laughs> because yeah. of our, and, and help me understand, because I think I do, yeah. um, that you, if we work this algorithm as our tool really in the background, yeah. And our goal is to balance enrollments mm -hmm. where we feel that perhaps they come out of balance, which may mean more kids going to blight. 
that there are children that might be slightly closer uh -huh. to central that we might recommend go to Blythe. They're still near, right? Right. So I know, but yeah. it says while remaining vigilant yeah. of the school's capacity. Yeah. I, I get it. I was but is it actually closer or is it just near? I and I think near is probably think, more accurate policy. I think that's more yeah. what we're trying to get at, right? Because we're not going to guarantee people. We're, what right. we don't want to do is guarantee that you will be going to the one that is, you know. Closest. I mean, they're, you know, around well, the blames. I, it uh, it anyway, it says anything, it's a goal. I think the, yeah. the current policy, it, it kind of in, it, it implies that, but the way it's in, put into practice and, and just by necessity, it's never really reflected that. Right, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. yeah, in fact, that the current boundaries are not even good boundaries you would draw if you're trying to draw the closest. No, they wouldn't. They're, no. they're, they're kind of no. drawn in a different way. Yeah. Um, well, that's, um, I think the heart of the policy is that we want kids to go to a school near their home. Right. You know, so mm -hmm. right. while making sure we're using right. capacity everywhere. And that's really what we mm -hmm. talked about sort of running a sample of how the algorithm might look and might work. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I think just running it yesterday and today put seven more children at Blythe because it's nearer or yeah. closer to their yeah. homes but if you left if you looked at current attendance center boundaries they might be central students mm -hmm. so so do you want so on this one the actual policy not the exhibit it says you know there's two sections and it says or is there right. that's Two different right. samples of the two different. Okay. Like, so do you have a preference for the language? Yeah, I was, was going to say, is there any like uh, background of why these two different ones, or how did we come to this, or are we supposed to be choosing today, um, or are we discussing? Discussing today. Mm -hmm. I mean, Dan, do you do you want do you want to take that one or go? Me too. Well, I I, I think um, you know just. It, Given the discussions amongst uh, Jeff, Martha, and myself, you know, we were distilling. I can't, we were coming down to two unique variations, I guess. That okay. at the end of the day, we Just wanted to present to the board to provide you know, the, the, the most, uh, the two best options that we were coming up with. Okay. Uh, just as an idea, again, of providing flexibility and with the idea that the, this is what we've discussed, this is what we've come to. Um, and you know, if, if uh, how we'll see how the board uh, likes the various languages that we have. Right. I mean, I guess I, I think I prefer the second the second formulation um, rather than the first. I think it's clear um, and says what we essentially want to say. Um, and the only difference is that is that second paragraph is the only difference. Yeah. I, th yeah, I was actually going to say I feel like the the first. Half of the first sentence of the first one could actually be included in the in the second one too. Like the first and school specific attendance areas have been replaced with a district wide attendance area. Yeah, that's when we went back and forth was because we it's it's uh, it's is it not is it not really true that we have a district wide attendance area? What does that mean? I guess is yeah, the question. I, you know, I, it's district wide. It's not really district wide attendance area because at the end of the day you're going to some school or other, right? So it seemed a little bit uh, vague. Uh, I guess my concern with the second, the second one, the second the paragraph of the second one is that, given this, given like sort of what we're looking at for next year in kindergarten size, we're going to be asking for increases. To I mean, I was hoping that this would at least reduce the need for like making an exception to the rule, and that unless we change their policy about class sizes, I mean, I, I would think that because we're tying it to that policy. And I'm thinking we either change that policy <coughs> where we remove the number of students that we have and try to keep it a, a low class size, or we stick with, we go with the first one. Because I, I think we're sort of, again, we're going to be, again, here in what, six months or so asking for an exception to that policy. What about this? I think you're, we're talking about class size policy. That's not necessarily covered as a part of this discussion. No, I, I know less. It's reference. Less, less it's reference. reference. Okay. I think the idea that um, there was, uh, I think the original idea, which I think it still should be in that in that sentence, is that um, we want to sign schools near their homes in. Um, in um, uh, but still taking into account the capacity of each school, basically. So I think we have to say something about the capacity of the schools. That's a sort of a, a, a decision that the superintendent has to make and say, well, this school can has 
this much space and this school has this much space. Um, I think the second one is lacking that, what you just said. Well, I agree. That, that should be in there, it's, uh, in my view. Yeah. yeah, if you're going to move anything, that needs to be there if you're going right. to uphold that that second remaining vigilant to the capacity. I mean, right. The capacity should be in there. That's the one part that was missing. That's why I didn't like the second one at um, first. And then the other thing I think that might be in there is the capacity of the school um, and the, as well as the sort of what's mentioned in the exhibit, which is the um, using classroom space effectively across the district. Mm -hmm. We don't want to have one school that has, you know, it's so really crowded and another school that's, mm -hmm. you know, not crowded. So. I think there's those three ideas that somehow maybe should be in there. Um, I think we need a hybrid of these. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Well, and again, that was kind of the idea behind presenting them both to you. Mm -hmm. And I mean, looking back at it and thinking of it, I think the first one was based a little more on the recommendations from the attorneys that came back with, but that I don't know that the members of the committee had a good feel for it, didn't, didn't feel that it was, it, it, I think referenced a little bit back to the current policy a little too much, which was again something we felt was confusing and needed some clarification. Right. But if there, there's some aspects of that that we need to bring into the second, that's definitely well, one one possibility that that I thought might be would would do what we want is the, to have something like the superintendent or that designation will establish an unbiased enrollment process and objective assignment criteria. Assign students to schools near their homes, so that's the same as the original, the other two, subject to the constraints on each school's capacity, so that's yeah. point number one. The effective use of classroom space across the district, so that's getting the idea we want to sort of equalize across schools, and then and the district class size policy. Now, you, you raised the point, which is a valid point, which mm -hmm. is we kind of ignore the class size policy anyway, right? right. We override <laughs> that constantly. Um, <laughs> I don't know what to say about that. They are, they are linked to some degree. Um, they but, they uh, are, and I, uh, I guess it just seems like we, we have this policy that we don't adhere to. Right. I mean, I think. I mean, but, I, I know this is not part of the discussion tonight, but I think we. I don't think we want to, though. We, so we just want to acknowledge. To that we want we at least want to acknowledge that yes, we have a class. We have we a class size policy. We'd like to satisfy to the extent we can, yes. and maybe we can't. But right. I acknowledging I that as a goal, I think maybe is a in student members because it's important right. to say what we think is valuable in a classroom. We're going to do our best to get there. I, I don't know. I think but if you jump it up to a crazy number, then it... Well, no, right. I know what you're saying. I Some mean, there, there's mm -hmm. a difference between but, yeah. we'll do our best and we have to, this is a... Yeah, I'm not sure it says we or, have or, to. Or, or maybe, I'm know. sorry, or maybe we could put something in there. I mean, I guess the thing is, I'm just like looking at like maybe Central's going to have maybe 20 kids per class. Blythe will have 25, Hollywood will have 23. I think if we're gonna put something, I think it needs to be, the class sizes need to be equitable across the schools. I mean, I'm just saying that, that if we're gonna do something, that, I mean, because I feel, feel sometimes the schools, there's like some schools have smaller classroom sizes, some schools have larger classroom sizes. I think the schools, if we're gonna do this, needs to be like, if, if I'm just doing like simple math, Right. If there's 100 mm -hmm. students, we have four school, I mean, four classes, it's like 25 per student. I mean, what, for, what I don't like that arbitrary, though. I wouldn't move a Hollywood student over to Blythe just to keep the numbers even. You know, I would no, want to keep I'm, those people where they want to be. Like, what, well, I think what you're bringing up is this issue that I think in my two years here, yeah. <laughs> um, the hardest transfers to make are Hollywood That's students right. so what to do you Central, do? which maybe as distance goes, but it's... Do you bring them across yeah, first, first, or do you keep yeah. them where you right. want Right. No, and I, and, and I, under, I understand that. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, no. that's, that's, you've got First Avenue, but then I, I look at mm -hmm. Hollywood, who's always going to have the largest classroom size, and I don't think that's necessarily fair. How do you know it's well, always going to have the largest size, though? Well, Just they're going to be the landlocked because they're, they're, no one's going to cross First Avenue. Right, nobody's going to go up. No, but they're, the they're, they're the can most, go up and down. Well, they're I mean. the most likely to get the higher class right. because if you have somebody in the light or aim set, like the whole point of this you new policy is to, easily, right? yeah, right. It's, right, it's yeah, to make that, that so it say there's only 24 kids at Blythe at the end of the summer, mm -hmm. well, the easiest thing might be to move four of the closest ones to Ames to Ames or to Central. So mm -hmm. so basically, while I, I really like this policy and I like where we're going, I think what you mentioned is really where the one hiccup is, is that mm -hmm. we're talking about this, yet there's Hollywood. So we're not really talking about... I know. <coughs> <laughs> so so we have to acknowledge that, that this policy or the, in, in doing the algorithm is, is really... 
if we if Hollywood went, when it wasn't in the picture, it'd be a very well, I guess I would say know, that goes even further than that, which is that this has nothing to do with the algorithm. This is this is a problem with the current policy. It's a, policy, it's right. a problem with any policy because no, it's just a factual. The factual right. fact that they're and, well, I know. No, once it's out there, exactly. no, and it's not even a policy thing. It's literally like geography. That? It's right. the geographical right. situation of what we so, have. So it comes down to what do we want to do? Do we want to say, okay, Hollywood's got 25 kids. All right, five of them are going to Central. Or do we want to say, yeah, it's kind of a tough thing to cross First Avenue, so maybe 25 is okay. I mean, that's the choice we have to make. And I don't right. think there's like a well, the, right answer there. There's that, that too. But there's also, and we've heard this before, is that the sing it's the issue is also with the single section schools because we've heard from the principals Kismir and Kim that the single section schools do better when the class sizes are a little bit higher. There's a little bit more social because of the social interaction with the kids. Am I so right? It's Kismir not a yeah. sort of. there's no magic number That's a good point. That's right. across the district. And it's also when when there's one extra child at a single district school, the policy is almost instantaneously violated. Whereas mm -hmm. if there's an extra student at mm -hmm. Ames or Central, the averages don't change as much. So I mean, part of it's just what we have to work with. Right. right. And I we haven't come up with a good answer on Hollywood and First Maybe Avenue. Maybe there should be a. Part of the policy it talks about discretion of the principals to create the best environment for the family. Right, so if we leave the policy sort of very general like this and just talk about the things that we are trying to do, which is get the kids near a school yeah. that's close to them to the extent possible, subject constraints on school, you know, uh, capacity, classroom, you know, um, classroom space across the district, and you know, the class size policy, which yes, is not ever exactly adhered to, but that is our goal. Mm -hmm. We leave it general like that. That does give some, I think, discretion to the administration to say, in this particular circumstance, then we should sort of be doing this this year. You know, which I think is kind of we have to so, make those judgment calls. Mm -hmm. Not we, but yeah. the administration. They does. do. I would think, back to what David was saying, just briefly, like the class size policy, I think, is something that would have to be possibly reviewed in light with this because. The, the fact that we are space constrained and a public school who has to take mm -hmm. children who live in this district, having an exact number and a policy is a little <coughs> difficult to follow. I don't know. I've seen other policies, and I don't know how yeah, we feel how about it. Yeah, others just don't have specific. The most I've seen don't have specific so numbers. So we did they some say. research on it, and I I'd have to pull it back but up. I've forgotten. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say most, so we looked at, again, sort of our neighboring districts, um, yeah. most do not have a written policy. They tend to have guidelines around class size. Okay. Uh, and they might have a policy that says, um, we'll look to, you know, sort of achieve a successful learning environment for all children. So it's, um, I think we are a rare case that we put mm -hmm. actual numbers in, the, in a policy. You've also made the point in the past that um, this notion of class of, of classroom size is a little bit antiquated as well because it goes back to this idea of a single teacher with a certain set of students. And mm -hmm. nowadays, you've got you know we've heard tonight we got all these other people coming in and out, and it's not just right. one teacher with this group of kids, right? No, all like at Central, so it's, it's, they go to someone for yeah. for social studies, they go to someone else for English, well, and they move to yeah. their room. Right. And but we've know. been talking about how a reading specialist comes in, the math yeah. interventionist comes yeah, in, yeah, special education I mean, teacher mm -hmm. comes in. And so you really start to talk about what's effective instruction. Right. Um, what, I, what I find interesting right now is the evidence-based funding formula mm -hmm. is coming out with a recommended class size of 20 for elementary students. So it's very much in keeping with our policy. Um, and, and that, so I think there's an interesting moment right now when school districts have been, school districts have been perhaps taking more Way needing more opportunity to create that just right learning environment for children. Um, what is that just right number continues to be a very interesting question in education, to educators and in education, to school boards, to parents. I just think we need to, as we're thinking about revising this, just also have to think like, is it solving, and I'm a proponent of this, I think we need to move change but is it solving the tough does it like does it help us decide when there's 25 kids at Hollywood what are what are no. what the plan is and and I think that's maybe what David was kind of getting mm -hmm. to is that while I think this policy is is actually in the right direction I think there's still some questions about um, I think we want to we want the policy to make the decisions 
more transparent and mm -hmm. uh, obvious and I'm not sure it does that yet. I don't know how to do that. Well, I'd be in favor of revisiting the other one and maybe we could talk about no. other class the size. other class size policy mm -hmm. and see. I, mean, I like this policy, I don't get me wrong. I yeah, think I this is definitely the right way to go. I'm just thinking that now as I realize about the evidence-based model, we're coming down to 20, mm -hmm. so what are we gonna do? If we can like conceivably accommodate, meet that with 20 kids, are we going to basically say okay because of evidence funding we're going to now move? But the, state the other thing I'll remind everybody is money for that, that. That's uh, evidence based funding is not a mandate. Right. It's no. based on kind of that e effectiveness. Um, right. But I mean these yeah. these are these no one's going to be happy moving. I mean and I I understand. That. I mean I remember when I moved first we first moved here we knew that our kid might our daughter might not go to Hollywood and I was like oh geez we got. Mm -hmm. This is very real. I mean, no one wants to, to move. I, I, I totally get that. But at the, the same token, it has to be, we have to sort of somehow make it so it's like transparent, open, mm -hmm. equitable, mm -hmm. so that, you know, if we do have to move like two or, I mean, we're at 24 right now in Hollywood, if we do right. have to move like two or three kids from Hollywood. Um, right, and that's what, the, that's what the algorithm will do for you. It's like mm -hmm. if you decide, here's the limit. Right. Right. Then it'll say, well, then take these. Take these two the kids. Yeah. Right. 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 So right, but that's the right. the algorithm can't tell you to do that. You have yeah. to decide. You right. have to. Right. 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 I, just, I, think I in, just do not believe that. So. Right, and I think in past discussions prior to the, the idea of the 20 number coming up from evidence-based funding, I think that what was said was that you know, literature was ne not necessarily clear on that point. And what and I think trying to find something to reference that for the original policy of 20, I think we had to reach back about several decades, was that it? Yeah, so there's this Tennessee <coughs> Star study that still sort of holds true as perhaps mm -hmm. one of the sort of best research pieces on class size, which talked about small class size, small being around 20. So I think I think the question this so board is asked, or is it, I think it's even lower, or is it even lower? Yeah. It's also 15, right. Mm. But is 21 so different than 20? Is night, does, do children when there's only 19, are they at an advantage? So I think, I think we are talking about 25 to 30, but we're talking about relatively small. So I think it gets into that issue of exactness, too. And mm -hmm. for a family to stay at Hollywood and not cross First Avenue and have 21 or 22, but right now we're looking at 20, 24 20, students 20 currently plus. enrolled mm -hmm. in what would be considered the Hollywood right. attendance. Right. Right. Which is probably right. Right. But To the degree of transparency. Yeah, I mean, it's easy right. to see us having to so there's but, Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, to, to the idea of transparency, again, I think we're, we're removing the language about uh, the attendance areas, which, again, I think it was misleading at best and, for the most part, really not possible to adhere to. So from that aspect, I think we replace mm -hmm. it with the idea that, you know, uh, yes, we have the district-wide attendance area, but at the same time, our goal is to make, it neighbor, make the schools neighborhood mm -hmm. right. and have kids go to schools that uh, are close. So as a follow-up to what you just said, Dan, and also to address Dan's point, what if, what, what if we got rid of, get rid of um, the district's class size policy and just reference, and second piece, um, yeah. just reference the school's capacity and the effective use of class space across the district? That will kind of kick the problem back to school capacity. Mm -hmm. And then that's where maybe we can say, we can maybe update the policy, the class size policy, and say the capacity is, you know, this many spots per per class, basically, and that takes it out of this policy and makes it, you know, makes it a sort of a because it's a little bit orthogonal, it's a little bit of right, orthogonal right, right, issue, right, right, um, right. and then we can talk about the class size policy sort of as a separate issue. Mm -hmm. I, I think that has merit. I think we're going to have to have more discussion about it mm -hmm. and. I now have three uh, three thoughts. One is <laughs> what David and Dan just said is absolutely true, and the these hard and fast boundaries mm -hmm. never really worked in the first place. But the whole point of them was to get us to neighborhood schools, and that's really why people 
Right. I think that's a big reason this town, kids. this district is desirable. Right. You know that your kids are going to be able to walk to school, they're not going to go on the bus, and you're going to be with your friends, mm -hmm. or you're going to be with your neighbors. neighbors. And so that builds community. Mm -hmm. Getting to the class size policy issue, when we talk about the Tennessee study, has education and the services we provide with our pull-ins and pull-outs and gifted and special ed, they probably didn't really exist at the time the study was done. So the study may not have as much validity as we once thought. Um, number three, and this is the evidence-based funding model is not designed to ideally help wealthy districts. The whole point of evidence-based funding, and this I'll mention this next time, is to address inequities in funding and bring up low-funded schools. It is not at all meant to provide a great educational environment. It's, the whole point is to address funding and state funding specifically. And I think we need to understand better, and I know Martha's looking at that in terms of what this is really going to mean five years down the road. Right. We, we know we're, we're supposed to not take a hit next year, but mm -hmm. state funding is a mess, and so we know that's going to be... I wouldn't put a lot of stock... I guess what I'm trying to say is I wouldn't put a lot of stock in what evidence I, I totally funding says well, in terms of class of The reason sizes. the word evidence is in the, the word evidence-based funding is because it sounds good. You, who could be against Correct. evidence based by <laughs> evidence? Right. evidence. <laughs> but if you look at the evidence, it's completely, you know, it's not yeah, evidence. Well, it's just, it's... Not giving money to gifted education um, and it's really not giving I, the state any money no, to help us with our right. class sizes. Yeah, I so had a long discussion We, we need with to make our decisions. So we already are. Well, yeah. I, mean, I had a long discussion with a gentleman who was a big proponent of evidence-based funding. He's an advocate and essentially a lobbyist for it. And his his intents are good, but it's not about, it's about funding. It's about, it's yeah. about inequities in funding. Yeah. It's not about... 50th of all states in the right. disparity I mean, between uh, the wealthy districts and like, yes. lot, like we are the worst. We that's are the most unequal. But that's entirely yeah. based on yes. state funding. It doesn't right. include the whole pot. And I guess that's her. I mean, we, this is something that always comes up every time we talk about property. I mean, I know I mean a little tangent here, but, but the way state funds education here is deplorable. I mean, correct. It's just absolutely deplorable right. the way they do fund it because it's it causes segregation. And then we get evidence-based funding that makes it sound good, but it really doesn't do. I mean, it just moves numbers around, makes things more complicated, gets really complicated formulas that no one seems to understand. And then it's to, to be. I haven't spent enough time with the formula to understand it, but that formula still relies heavily on the contributions of wealthier districts to their own schools. It's not a. It's trying to reduce inequities, but it's it's nowhere. It's nowhere near addressing the real issue, which is the state just doesn't. I agree. Well, so um, like coming, back to, the, coming back to the policy here, I guess. Um, <laughs> As we so can talk about sorry, the state of education yeah. in Illinois. Right. <laughs> we, see, we see a hybrid or something. Well, what I'm, what, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm sort of going to propose is, uh, is, is what, if, what if we have something like the superintendent does need to establish an unbiased enrollment process and objective assignment criteria to assign students to schools near their homes. We Everyone likes that, right? That right. part of it, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone's yeah. Yeah. If, what um, if someone asks, what's this objective criteria? The, the in practice, it's going to be an algorithm. It's going to okay, be this algorithm. Then you need I think. To, as long as you're okay, to I, but, but I think that's that's going to come in the second part. But, okay, but this, I think. Um, mm -hmm. But so so the first part of the sentence is okay. Everyone agrees with that. And then, yeah. subject to constraints on each school's capacity and the effective use of classroom space across the district, leave out the class size policy because that could be then sort of factored into what is the capacity of school. Is everyone okay with something along that line? No, I like that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Does that sound good to you, Dan? It does. Okay. Um, and then keep the first sentence about committed to neighborhoods. Right, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yes. Um, okay, then and then and then the second part is I don't know if Dan you wanted to talk about this is the the, the actual exhibit. The exhibit um,
kindergarten student assignment. That's the one, that's the key right. one that's sort of changing. Mm -hmm. Exhibit uh, E or E1 or whatever that is. E. I was going to say, I think one of the key pieces of communication that I know the board wants to make clear, I want to make clear, is this issue of children staying with siblings, right? So siblings move together, stay together. Um, so that really is what this kindergarten student assignment, it talks about a time period. Um, and this is very similar to our other one. Um, and then once assigned to a school, a student will be able to remain in that school through fifth grade. Mm -hmm. um, all parents would be notified of school assignment on or before June 30th. Um, and then it, go, it talks in the middle section there, I'm kind of jumping around, but siblings with older siblings in attendance will be assigned to the same school unless otherwise requested by a parent or guardian. Um, so I think that was one of the questions we thought might be coming up in the community was that uh, when we talk about this student assignment policy that we were going to maybe change children already assigned, already seated, already in attendance, and that's not what we're doing here at all. It's really about kindergarten and newly enrolled students. Mm -hmm. So this is very similar, other than it removes that whole wait list, which seemed just kind of, in practice, not not perhaps the best practice, that it's really an issue of transferring if a family really wanted, even after a year or two, to be reassigned. And sometimes it's because they want to go back to the school that they thought they might be going to. Um, could be a Hollywood family, for example. Um, some families have, in my short time here, have come and just asked for a transfer, sometimes for like a, a social reason for their child, too. So mm -hmm. that's why I think it's under sort of the discretion of the superintendent, the team to really think about individual student needs when requested by a parent, a tra when a transfer is requested by a parent. So I, I've got one minor question about this, which is um, the old policies uh, was explicit about older siblings said students with older siblings in attendance the following school year will be assigned to that school first that means that if um, they have an older sibling who's going to be in the same elementary school then they get to go there like your situation share your yeah. your older daughter is Hauser yeah your younger daughter is going to enroll in kindergarten I only have one the, under the old that. under the uh, <laughs> yeah, so, I didn't do it <laughs> under the under the old policy your younger daughter would not be kind of grandfathered in right. because your older daughter is no longer at Central, she's at Hauser. Right. That does, so that situation does arise. And I think, yeah. Dan, you have maybe the similar, similar situation. I mean, it's the yes. same campus, right. the way you tell the mom is driving around. Right, so. I mean, it's the same drop off. For, for you and for Hauser, but for other schools, it might not, for, I mean, well, Blythe, it might not be. No, well, I mean for Central. Okay, like, for Central, right. Right, right. So, I guess the question I had, so the new, the new wording is siblings will be assigned to the same school to be assigned to the same school unless otherwise requested by the parents, it doesn't make that case dis dis clear. It doesn't say, it doesn't that clear what you do in that case. Okay. I, I sort of, I prefer the old policy because mm -hmm. the reason for that policy is because, okay, you got some kids going there already, you should continue to go there. But if your kids are already out of the schools already or at Hauser or the high school, then that shouldn't give you any sort of special treatments. You know, you know what I'm saying? You guys understand that the, the I, 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 I follow. Yeah, I I, I, uh, I agree completely. I, I wasn't aware that that aspect of it was taken out. I, does it say that? Anymore? Here, here's the old wording right here. No. Can you read it? The old wording was um, students with older siblings in attendance the following school year will be assigned to that school first. In attendance to that. School. So if your if your daughter um, was it older daughter was say in third attendance. grade. She would be still at Central, and you say, "Ah, oh, your your right. your your younger daughter would automatically." No, I know people like that. Yeah, they right, yeah. but so that's the it does it sort of. But if your older daughter's out of the school, mm -hmm. then the, you you wouldn't get, be automatically assigned to that. So okay. it's older siblings in attendance. It, it needs to indicate that they're going to be continuing in like elementary school attendance. The following year. school year, so they're gonna they you can't have a kid who's about to be in kindergarten and a kid who's about to graduate fifth grade mm -hmm. because you no longer have that right. tie. Right. That, so the, the, the older way is, is clearer on that, I, I agree. So if you're an, al like an alumni of the elementary <laughs> school, it doesn't mean doesn't that, yeah. 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 correct. Right. Right. So are people okay with retaining the older language there? Um, as I would Only if the central house are people, I mean, because those, I know those families are going to say but that would. You know, it would sort of indicate that if you have a child at Hauser, you get to go to Central. Mm -hmm. No, no, well, that's not. That's what we don't no, want to do. I'm not right. saying that. I'm just saying some people. I, I walk, but some people that drive are going to want to 
But that would be the, the same with any. Right. I mean, that's the same for anybody as a Hauser student. I know. To any of the schools. And I, guess but, and I guess my thing with that. Or my, the older sibling walks the other one. I have no idea. I guess but, my, my concern with the, that, I don't though, know. is all our kids are eventually going to end up at Hauser. Hauser. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 going to be the one who's going to. I know. I just becomes. I know of families, and I'm right. not. I'm not there yet. That have the older sibling walk, or the older sibling picks up the other one at Central, because, and they wait outside for the Hauser kid. But I think you need to turn that around and say, I for know. the parent who has a kid going to Blythe yeah. and the I Hauser, know. I know. we shouldn't be showing a favoritism towards. Never if it's favoritism. It's just that's. Well, the so basically, that, argue, that argues for retaining the, the old language, any, basically. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. So I currently, I don't experience it, but I know that there are older ones that do that. So retain that old language. Yes. Yep. I finally found it. Real. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Finally found it. And then can we see like the rewrites next time? Maybe. Um, and then the only other question I have is more substantive, which is, um, uh, which is. If we fall, if we're deciding to use the algorithm, that, that's making a choice about how we're going to uh, assign students. There is a definite choice there. It's, mm -hmm. it's a definite algorithm. There are other possible algorithms you could come up with. It's not the only one you could imagine. I think we have to be explicit about what we're doing. We have to say this algorithm assigns students yeah. to the closest school, yeah. subject to the constraints um, on school capacity. And, and what it does, it does that by minimizing the total walking distance. Yeah. Yeah. That much we have to say. And we have to put that So if we decide yeah. to change that somewhere later yeah. on the road, like, mm -hmm. then we need yeah. to sort of, but that I think has to be explicit I think total somewhere. Total walking distance. Total walking distance. That's the important right. part. That's absolutely key. It, it's walking did we distance. hear back from the attorneys in terms of differences in language for exhibit versus attachment or? So exhibit and administrative procedures are, are really essentially the same thing. Mm -hmm. What she really talked about is Sometimes policies have an exhibit that really describes an administrative procedure. I think because how we do it really matters. Some, some how we do it, I, perhaps is maybe not not that interesting to the to the public. That's my my paraphrase. Um, so, I think the question is is not about the exhibits. It's about using the terminology and information about the algorithm. So. Um, like I went back and looked at the California school district that we've talked about that has a, a similar policy. Um, I think what they do is they do a really nice job on their website with a lot of good communication. And that's why I have this um, like proposed frequently asked questions. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of ways that you can absolutely explain to people the tool we're currently using. Um, part of what our attorney is saying is, what if you decided not to do it that way in three years? Like you found, like you still want to have this unbiased, objective criteria that really speaks to school's capacity that speaks to class size and speaks to children being educated near their homes to preserve the neighborhood school concept. But the tool, if we can explain, I, I absolutely think we should explain it. I don't know that we should explain it in policy or in the exhibit. But I, I agree with the policy and agree with what you're saying, but the only, the only caveat I would make is that in the procedure, I think we should say what it is we're doing. We're minimizing total walking distance subject to constraints. Because even if three years from now you say, oh, you know what, I want to minimize that, I want to minimize the yeah. total walking distance, square, whatever, something else, mm -hmm. then you, in three years you change the wording, basically, so people know what mm -hmm. you're doing then. It's, it's a board decision to right. change it, right. so right. I'm not... Right. Why can't we just link it to an exhibit? Like you exactly. click on right. it and you link and it talks right. about the algorithm. Like I mean, we could, we could do, I, I, I would almost want to be more generic and say distance instead of walking distance, uh, because it's essentially the same if we do, like, time, time to walk, like, number of what have you. I think we should just keep it distance because somebody from kid, I know my kid, <laughs> takes forever to walk. <laughs> and so what would be uh, I, like like I think the I, difference. I, I like it walking distance. I'm just well, walking distance, I mean, as opposed to driving distance because some roads are one way and all that kind of stuff. So. Well, and sometimes you're sitting there for yeah, half an hour waiting for priests to get out. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say walking distance I think needs to be to make sure it's defined in one of the frequently asked mm -hmm. questions or something about yeah. what you mean by walking distance idea. because it would be different than mm -hmm. the driving distance. That's and right. Honestly, I can... You know, if I'm walking, if I'm a kid and I'm walking, I'm going to cut through somewhere, and it's not walking, you know, right. that. It's walking the direct route to your school, right. you know, because if with our curvy streets too, 
cutting through is clearly quicker. You know what I mean? So I think. So I, th I think the algorithm. Maybe def we're, we're not talking about cutting through neighbors' backyards. No, no. <laughs> making sure. But I mean, seriously, there are some places like, like if you are on the Central Hauser campus, sometimes if you cut through something, you don't have to go all the way this way. Well, that's way. the negative bonus cut through, but I don't want to define that. <laughs> right. Well, I think that's the question. Do you want to define the algorithm in the exhibit, right? Do you, do you mm. or do you want to define the algorithm somewhere I, else? I don't think you need to sort of define the algorithm so much as um, to say what it is the algorithm is. What doing. are the criteria? Just to say mm -hmm. it's getting the walking distances walking from distance. Google. It's Google saying what's the walking distance from mm -hmm. point A to point B, mm -hmm. and then once it knows the walking distances, it minimizes the total walking. So that's all we have to say. We don't have to say it does this by calling this routine or that routine. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 sure. yeah. I would be Same. fine if it just says minimizing walking, walking, walking distance. distance, and then walking. Yes. The definition of walking distance is like a, a Whatever FAQ. That's you know? fine. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't think. I personally don't think you have to say as defined by Google, but right. I don't think yeah. you need to do yeah. that. I think that can be like sure. just outside yeah. on the yeah. website. Yeah. I guess that by referencing Google, it comes back to we're referencing essentially a you know a third party or right. something that's pub publicly available information. Yes, that, that could be explained in the FAQ. Right. Yeah, 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 I just don't. I don't think in the policy. We, I think we just I need to say I think you need walking. We just say minimize walking distance. Yes. Yeah. Right. And and if we want to do an F, like an FAQ, FAQ then we can say fine. what we're using at that time. But I don't. Because then you can adjust. Because we might not. We might use something else later. That's on the right. right. Exactly. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah, like one of the questions I, is how does the algorithm work to assign students? Yeah. You know, so I think that's, I mean, it's really interesting. I think it's, if, if it becomes the tool that really works for us, I think we want to be as transparent mm -hmm. as possible. Yeah, no, I, I think that is a great idea. Who runs the algorithm? <laughs> <laughs> Don and Jonathan right now. So, um, yeah. um, um, so are we saying something about the algorithm? And in, in so that's where the question, right, before the well, board I about think the. We should say. I think everyone agrees. We should say minimize walking distance what we're somewhere doing in, in the exhibit. Maybe yeah. Yeah. the algorithm minimizes total walking distance right. Right. subject to constraints. Um, but we, we're not. But I'm saying say, on the website at school, you should be able to click on that, and then it just takes you to the. Here's what we're using. Like I found on the California website that yeah. I was looking at, a lot of clicks. Took you back to this explanation, right? You know, it was school assignment, school enrollment, uh, frequently asked questions. You know, I mean, so I, and I, I think it was it's a really good example of th this. This right. becomes a very important piece of information um, to lots of families when you're moving here, when you're enrolling your children for the first time. So I think we can certainly do that. Do you want to say maintain the neighborhood school concept by minimizing walking distance? Like, do you want to do you want to just? You could do it that way. Oh, clear. Um, yeah. Maybe we should think about a little bit about how we want to phrase that exactly. Okay. Where, in, where in the exhibit, maybe we okay. can bring it back to the board uh, sure. next time. Maybe. Sounds good. Yeah. I think this information should be shared with the realtors too. I'm not kidding. No, a no, lot really, of the families yeah. move in. The, and I would ask my friend, oh, where are you going? And they said, oh, they told me I'm going, the realtor told me I'm going here. Yes. And sometimes it was not correct. Yeah, so we want to make sure everyone's getting or right or they mm -hmm. could be in a situation or th or live, they were like where correct, I live, where I'm on the border of three schools and eight, any of them are pretty equal distant from right, me. Or it was I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we would so, probably be yeah. the ones that who are shifted yeah. around if need be. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely agree about that. Yeah. Okay. Done. <laughs> okay. Anything else, Dan? Uh, I think we've had enough. <laughs> <laughs> I second that. Uh, future meeting dates are May 16th, regular business at 7 p.m. at Hauser, June 6th, Committee of the Whole, 7 p.m. at Hauser, uh, June 20th, regular business, 7 p.m. at Hauser, and uh, July 4th, Committee of the Whole is canceled. Uh, if there's no Why? current business, then we're <laughs>